Welcome to the Living Skin Podcast. It's great to have you here with us today. Have you ever felt stuck in your career, your business, or just trying to find the true purpose in your life? Well, you're not alone. There are so many of us trying to create meaningful careers and even just trying to find ways to live our biggest life. Hi, I'm Beth Bialko, Director of Education Development and your host for today's very special podcast, which features our co-founder and chief visionary of Dermalogica, Jane Werwind. And today is going to be the perfect dose of inspiration for you to be thinking about how to drive your own success and make your dreams a reality. So welcome back to the podcast, Jane. Hi, Beth. It's so good to be here. And uh Lovely to be able to, to do this in this format and be able to see each other and chat. <laughs> yes, it makes a huge difference. We're still doing everything virtual, but one of these days we'll be back in the studio like yeah. we used to. And it was interesting. I was thinking this morning before we did our podcast is that this is our 10th podcast that you and I have done together since we started the Living Skin podcast. This is crazy. That's crazy. Am I your most, am I your most often invited guest? I mean, other people that have done 20. I, I need um, to know. No, I don't think so. I think you're, I think you're running at least in the top two, if not definitely okay. in first place. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I love that. Great. Not that I'm, com- not that I'm competitive or anything, but I love yeah. that for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, I think we all are when it comes to wanting to definitely, uh, have things such as the podcast, like the most listens or the most inspiring type of talks. But I thought it was yeah. such an interesting thing that we've come such a long way since the podcast started actually in December of 2017. So today I thought it was only fitting that in December of 2021, we get to round out the year with a special podcast with you. So thank, thank you. you for being here. Pleasure. Well, why we're here today, everyone, yes, we are here today to talk to Jane about her new book, which of course is out, and this is, if you don't have it already, (laughs) Skin in the Game, which is everything you need is already inside of you. Now, this has been a long-awaited book, I think, Jane, especially from a lot of our therapists and industry members who've been probably asking you for a very long time, when are you going to be you know, writing a book or putting all of your amazing ideas and stories and inspiration into a format that everyone can really dive into? And now it's here, right? It's a reality and it's such a beautiful and inspiring read. So I Thank do you. have to start off, which is let's talk about why you decided to write the book. I think that's a good place for us to begin for everyone to, to get the inspiration behind your journey to write yeah. in the game. Well, there's, you know, it, you're right. People had asked me over the years, uh, why don't I write it down? Write a book, especially, I have to say, especially students of, of mine from the very early days. And I'm talking now sort of like pre internet, pre I'm talking when it was word of mouth was literally you had to find someone and talk to them. Mm-hmm. And I was teaching most of the classes. Uh, we had, you know, one or two other teachers part time. And it was a, f- a few years after that, that Laura West joined us, our fabulous Laura West, um, as our number two teacher. But at that stage, whatever we said in the classroom was only heard in the classroom. Right. And so a number of my students had reached out to me and said, you know, Jane, do you remember that story? Or do you remember when you this little hack you showed us? Yeah. Can't, can you please write it down? I can't remember exactly how it went, but that, so th- that sort of thing was going on. And I thought, you know, I don't know, should I write a book that's, you know, get it all down. And I do a lot of speaking, as you know, but I think we've done congresses around the world together, etc. But that's not quite the same thing as, as putting it in a book. For me, a book is something solid. It's sort of like the written word. And I, and I decided, you know, at some point, as maybe many of us do, so one day, one day, I'll write a book. And I then decided to sort of get a bit real about it because, you know, d- the runway runs on in your life and you suddenly think, well, you know, I better write things down while I can still, you know, bloody well remember them for one day. <laughs> so I don't want to get to the center. I don't know what I'm, you know, I don't remember that at all. So um, I started thinking, what would I write a book about? 
And I, so, I didn't want to write a skincare book per se. I mean, I could have done that, but I, I, I didn't feel that was unique really because we've now got so many teachers around the world that are teaching our method. We all teach the same method. We've spread that word. I really feel we've made a big impact in our education, in our work. And I think that that's solid. So I thought, well, I don't really want to write a book about that. What do I want to write about? And I will tell you, and I detail this a bit more in the book, as you know, I had two false starts of subjects I thought I wanted to write about. And when I got into it, not only did book agents I was trying to find and publishers think it was not quite the heat of my message, I knew, you know, one was about apprenticeships and skill set training. One was about invisible entrepreneurs, the small businesses on the high street, and all of those are important subjects. But I didn't feel that I was the only one that could write that. And one of the things I teach, as you know, is what is it that you can do that no one else can do? What is your strength and what is your weakness? Because oftentimes those are the same thing, just flipped in reverse. And so I really sat down and thought long and hard about what is it that only I could write and well that means it has to be a, the story of whatever happened to me and is it a memoir and it is and it's also a business book because it's how do you how are you an entrepreneur how did you self-fund fourteen thousand dollars to start Dermalogica and you never gave away any partnership or equity how did we do it how did Raymond and I do that and how did you come up with 27 products right out the gate and how did you name them and then what's your hiring process like? What's your firing process like? So I wanted to write down some business things. And then also, I'm a parent of two grown children. I've been in a relationship with Raymond. We're married for 40, over 40 years now. How does that work? You know, keeping all that going. Life's not about balance. It's about resilience. And I talk about that. And I also believe in magical thinking. And I believe that we manifest what we truly need in our lives if we are aware of what it is we truly need. And I talk about that as well. So it's a book about all of that. So when I started writing it, and, and it, was, it was crazy because another thing I talk about in the book is when things are meant to happen, they will happen smoothly. And if it's not going smoothly, you have to stop and pause and say, wait a minute, what, it should be easy. You know, once, Think of nature, when nature gets going, when a river is moving, it's going to its destination. It it's, knows its way. It won't be a straight line. Rivers don't run in a straight line. Only canals run in a straight line because they're built by human beings. But in nature, everything is a curved, a curved, bumpy, sort of hilly, downhill, uphill, rocks, rapids. But if you've suddenly slowed down, you're kind of in a still water. That may mean you've lost the main flow of the river and you kind of drifted to the side. So I knew in those first early starts, it I wasn't meant to be writing about that. It wasn't smooth enough. It wasn't easy enough. It wasn't, um, it didn't feel like it had a momentum or a flow. I couldn't find an agent that really was a fit for me. Then I couldn't find the publisher that was right. So I knew I got to go on reset, which I did. So now I'm gonna give you the timeline because this is where this whole sort of journey makes sense to me. I had a call from my book agent in December of 19, 2019. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, Harper Collins are interested in this idea you've got. So it was just an idea that I shared with my book agent. Uh, will you take a call? And I said, sure. So end of December, I took a call from Harper Collins. In January, 2020, we had a book deal and a contract signed. And they said to me, we need the manuscript finished by September nine months and I thought well heck I mean that's going to be hard because first of all I haven't even started dreamscaping this uh, this idea you know I want to get my I, I like to do a big board as you know with words on and colors on and I'll write down random things like you know sausages I mean it could be anything and th that starts to help me get my form that's how I design a presentation and that's how I decided I would design the book and I thought, I've got a busy travel schedule. We've got product launches coming up. I don't, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to really think about how I'm going to do this. And of course, I started writing in February. And in March of 2020, we went into a lockdown. And I thought, right. oh, okay. So 
all right, so I'm going to have at least a few weeks to write this manuscript. And then turned into, as we, as we now know, a couple of years. Right. Um, and what I realize now, and this is the, the sort of the journey of, of it, that was when I was meant to start writing the book because the book is actually about what, how do you reset your life, your career, a relationship? How do you hit the reset button and say, I don't think how I'm doing this is working. I don't think what I doing is working. I don't think my career is on track. I talk about how, that in the book when I had a moment where I thought I have to get this together. Otherwise I, I'm not going to have the life I want to live. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reset a relationship, even a marriage? And I talk about my first marriage and, and the decision I came to that that was not the right choice for me uh, or them, obviously. And then, and then how do you reset even the country you live in? I've emigrated to two different countries, South Africa and the United States came here with a suitcase and my, you know, beauty school diploma rolled up inside and no money. And okay, so what does that look like? And how do you get through those moments? And we've all done tough things. We've all done tough stuff. So it's not that my story is singular, but I think that by sharing all those things, it adds up to something that I'm actually really proud of. And it's, to me, it's sort of like a love letter to our industry um, I could not have had my life without the professional salon industry. I couldn't have had it without amazing students. And, and you were a student, uh, Beth. And so, you know, those many of those went on to join Dermalogica, open Dermalogica salons, um, be in positions of leadership in, in our industry. And I'm really proud of that. And so that's sort of all about having skin in the game. And that's that's the title of the book. Everything you need is already inside you. We just have to find out where. I think that's such a great way of really putting it to the fact of there's so many different facets of this book. Now, of course, you know, I have read it twice now. So <laughs> <laughs> I, you, know, you and can also get the audio book, you know, I'm, I write exactly. the audio book. Exactly. We do. There is an audio version, which we are going to talk about that today. And I mean, I even have two versions. One is like keeping it very clean and pristine. And I have a second copy of the book where I'm like highlighting and then like scribbling in. Um, because as you know, as an educator, we just have like a little of this type A personality. <laughs> we want to keep our notes. And then of course, you know, our, our guiding piece completely yeah. separate. Yeah. And I think that's what's so inspirational behind this is like how many aspects of your life actually have contributed to where you are today. And it's not always just the good stuff. And I think that's what, you know, even as we move forward into careers or business or family relationships, learning how to navigate those areas where it's not the most comfortable or it is the most challenging that kind of brings you, I think, even better and stronger out on onto the other side as well. Now, you mentioned that um, you talked a little bit about um, Raymond and different aspects of your life growing up and your childhood. There's a lot of actually personal, intimate stories in this mm. book. And I know there's quite a bit about your childhood and your relationship with your mom and your sisters. So can you share just a couple, a couple pieces from the book that, that our listeners can look forward to, to read or to hear on the audio version if they haven't done so already? Yeah, and I'm going to share something uh, new with you too. So oh, great. Uh, about about the book that I only just learned. Okay, so, okay, good. So um, yeah, I, look, we I believe that the hardest things, the most painful things in our life, are also often the most productive. Mm -hmm. And I, I, my analogy, and I love analogies, is you know, my analogy is you know, when you give birth, it's not the most comfortable thing you've ever done, and it's a life-changing moment for for many people and mm -hmm. you know, the baby yourself whoever's your partner your family you know the world right so I we can't avoid the the pain of living and none of us none of us do we so how do we deal with it how do we somehow turn that into something positive so I could tell my childhood story and it would sound pretty tragic because my mother was widowed at age 38 with four girls to raise. I was two years old, a month short of my third birthday 
when my father died suddenly uh, at 50 years of age. And my mother was left. She had not worked since she got married. There was no money. We didn't, I didn't come from a wealthy family. There wasn't a trust fund. In fact, my father died with the mortgage insurance, the insurance for our mortgage on a, their very first house that they just purchased, having lived in, in council housing, um, you know, public housing. And so he died with that insurance policy in his pocket, no, not signed. So my mum, you know, was in this brand new house and they'd only been there a few months and she had a mortgage to pay and she had to go back to work. And she figured it out because she had a skill set. She was a trained nurse. So the dot, I talk about the dots on the paper of our life that seem random. And yet actually they all join up just like those connect the dot puzzles when we're children. The dots are all in front of us as we're looking at our life, but it's when you join them up, it's the bits between what happened that actually show you what is in front of you. And so my mum sort of drummed into my sisters and myself, learn how to do something. You have to have a skill set that you can literally turn on a penny and, and get a job. And that became really important to me, this idea of being self-determined. It wasn't about becoming wealthy or rich. or That, that really hadn't occurred. To, I haven't really thought about that. But I definitely wanted to be financially independent. I wanted to be able to you know, pay my rent, get my dry cleaning out of the dry cleaners and you know, drive a car, whatever it was. I wanted to be self-sufficient. And that element has always been important to me in my life. Mm -hmm. I've had relationships where people have said to me, you know, oh, you, you care, you're very ambitious, you care so much about success. And I said, well, actually, no, that's not it. What I care about are the options, choices, and opportunities that come with being self-determined, that come with financial independence. So I've always been especially um, connected to this idea of women or somehow underserved communities um, of people that, that need to have the chance to be self-determined because that was my mom and that was my family and you know I don't know how she scraped together keeping us going on a nurse's salary at that time she worked night shifts I talk about that I went to school at four and a half years old and my mom tied our back door key around my neck and hid it in my school uniform and told me not to ever tell anyone that that was there because I used to go around the back of the house and let myself in at the back door at four and a half, which now, of course, I realize, I mean, I would call child services probably <laughs> if I saw that happening. But oddly, I felt very em empowered. I felt mm -hmm. very um, trusted. I felt like I had a job to do. I, and then I also talk in the book how I would play out these enormous fantasy games in the empty house. Because when I got home, there was no one home. My sisters were older than me. They didn't get home from school from their middle and high school until about an hour later. So I would live out these full on fantasy games running around that, the house on my own. And I thought to myself that I had this magical imagination and you know, creativity. What I now realize is I was sort of distracting myself mm -hmm. from the fear and the loneliness of being alone. And, I, and so I, I dig into that because when you write a book, I didn't know any of this. I had no idea how to write a book, but I realize now when you write a book, it's very cathartic because I'd read, I'd heard people say that. Mm -hmm. And as you're writing, you sort of discover things. You think, wow, I don't know if I want to share that. That's a bit painful, but I, I'm going to because it led to this. So right. I, if I don't tell this story, no one's going to understand why that piece became so important. Mm -hmm. so but I'll tell you something really really great so when I was sorting out the book I, I picked um, childhood pictures you know of of, um, of myself and my family just to kind of illustrate and my sisters sent me all kinds of random photos and because I was so small especially when my dad died I did not have any memory of a lot of those photographs but the one that I have always wondered about is this one I put it in the very front of the book Mm -hmm. Because this was, you know, this was my, one of my favorite, most poignant photos. Can you see that? Yes, I'm not doing I can. Job. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's me. It's me looking through the railings, sort of with some steps behind me, obviously going into some kind of house. And mm -hmm. I figured out this was our house, the house that my father and mother had just bought before he died. Okay. But I looked so 
worried and so serious and, and sort of quite philosophical at two years old. So I just now, now, I just got back last week from a trip to London for the book launch in the UK. And my three sisters, we're all very, very close, as you know, they all came up to London to join me. We had a, four days together. It was completely mad and they're ever so funny. So I love being with them. And we, they, I signed copies of the book and gave them each an inscription and they each had a copy. And we're sitting there in London and they're sort of looking at the photos and we're howling and carrying on about this that and the other and then my my elder sister Diana said to me I'm so pleased you used this photo in the mm -hmm. front of the book I think that was meant to be don't you and I sort of said oh well yeah I think it's one of the ones I really often look at and I look so serious and sort of grown yeah. up in it and my other sister Sally said uh, gosh I remember when that was taken and I said oh gosh I said isn't it our yeah. house in in Edinburgh and Sally said yeah but it was we were moving in. That was the day we moved in. Mm -hmm. And as it, okay. I kind of looked at it and I said, really? And my sister Diana said, do you know who took that photograph? And I said, no. Mm -hmm. And she said, dad. And oh Beth, my gosh. this is the only photo I have wow. where I realize I am looking at him. Mm -hmm. And he is looking at me. Mm -hmm. We were seeing each other. And what I also know from my sisters is that he was taking a break from the moving because he didn't feel very well. And a few months later, he had a massive heart attack and died. And I now see so much meaning in that photograph of me staring. And I know now I was looking literally right into my dad's eyes. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. me, you learn about your life all the way through your life it never stops and I'm so grateful that my sisters had those memories and I'm so grateful yeah. I put that photo in that place in the book so that they were spontaneously talked yes. about it with that they never realized I didn't know that how would I know that right and you yeah. just found this out on your when you were in London and yeah I just found that out two weeks ago oh my gosh and I'm now 63 oh my gosh. years of age and oh I just gosh. found that out two weeks ago so that is the book has, that's the like book goosebumps has I yeah. know, right? So it's the book has provided point. lots of um, wow. continual insights. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think that's such a unique thing, especially because that picture does really, I mean, stand out as a reader. When you open that up and you see that, you know, yeah. you were about to go into a, a very deep personal story that is going to have a lot of different kind of twists and turns and how special for that to be the photograph that your that your father took of you so yeah yeah that is definitely a goosebump moment I was like sitting here just feeling right the kind of the anticipation of thinking what you were going to say next of who took the photo <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for sharing that it and I think I think that's like so interesting of each of these steps even from being in our, our childhood years and how things influence us and move us towards different kind of avenues or journeys or paths to where we're destined to be. And I think one of the questions that probably a lot of our therapists have, or even like the readers or listeners to the podcast is during all of these different um, celebrations and even challenges and sadnesses that can come in and out of your life during the book that you share, where did you find your inspiration for getting into skincare? and becoming a skin therapist? I think it started with my mum saying, learn how to do something. Mm -hmm. So in my head, it was always going to be something that I could, I would hold in my hands right. and hopefully in my heart, because I think that's how, you know, you find your, your purpose is when it connects right. your head, your heart and your hands. So that was sort of in my head, but I got my first job at age 13 and um, I walked into the local hair salon in the small town in the south of England where I grew up uh, from nine years of age onwards and asked them if they needed someone to work on Saturdays. And thank goodness the salon hired me, even yeah. though it was illegal to hire anyone that young. Um, my job was doing laundry and hanging out in the staff room and getting everyone lunch. And I talk about that. And in that mm -hmm. process, it wasn't that I suddenly fell in love with doing the laundry. Right. But what I <laughs> fell in love with was I fell in love with this family I found in the salon, this, mm -hmm. this crazy, supportive, uh, combative 
family of stylists. It was a full service salon, stylists and nail technicians and one skin therapist. And I was in the staff room the whole time for the first two years I worked there. And then I got promoted to Shampoo Girl, which was my mm-hmm. official title. I talk yeah. about that. And then I was on the floor, which was amazing because I got to work with clients. And then I realized the clients are not just coming to have their hair done or not right. just coming to receive a treatment. They're coming because there's a connection here. They feel the connection I feel working here. Right. And and that became very, very big to me because it became deeply uh, reassuring. I felt supported and I did at home as well, but, but home was a different circumstance. So um, I knew when I saw what the skin therapist was, was doing mm-hmm. in the salon, I wanted to do that. And I went straight to study skincare as soon as I graduated from high school. And I've never done anything else. I've, I don't have a degree in anything other than then in skincare and uh, and body therapy and an electrolysis. I don't want to leave yes. that out. <laughs> and, uh, no, don't leave that out. So, yeah, no, don't leave that out. So um, it, it it became my life, and and I fell in love with I fell in love with the industry. Mm-hmm. takes takes a while because like any relationship, you yeah. know, you can go on a first date and think, oh my gosh, this is it, and you know maybe it is, but sometimes a couple of months later you think, oh, that really wasn't it. <laughs> But um, so it takes a while to really fall in love with someone or something. And you do that by perseverance and hard work, whether it's a relationship or whether it's your career. And in the process of that, I'm so grateful, Beth, that I had a two year training and a one year apprenticeship before I was fully qualified. And and that was the standard in the UK then. And I I probably would have bailed if I'd only had a few months training or perhaps not an apprenticeship because I wouldn't have known enough to start on my own. And I had enough time to fall in love with the work and Mm -hmm. to understand the value of the work and to want to share that as I became more more experienced. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a huge thing, especially as skin therapists and staying connected to not only your clients, but staying connected to your craft and to your skill. And it's yeah. just, there's always so much more than just, oh, I love applying product or I love giving skin treatments or I love waxing. There's yeah. such a bigger community aspect and con- human connection aspect that you've, that you've talked about as well. Now you yeah. mentioned earlier and that you had, of course, you had immigrated twice. You've gone to South Africa, then of course, coming to the United States. So when you immigrated to South Africa, there's, there's quite a few stories in your book during that um, experience and that excursion. And one of them was actually meeting Raymond. And yeah. I thought it would be really interesting to share maybe just a sneak peek into that first meeting that you had with him. Yeah. Thank you. So I went to South Africa uh, to, and I, my, my first job, I got my first job literally the, the day I started opening the yellow pages and calling salons. And I talk yeah. about that because yeah. when you have a skill set, you become incredibly emboldened by the idea that you will get a job. Yeah. And I did. And all the way through as well, one of the dots I, I want to always remember is that the support that was given to me by people in the industry always. And so that's one of the reasons why when we started the International Dermal Institute and Interdermalogica, mm-hmm. I feel very strongly about learning as a connected group. In other words, students coming into a class or onto a screen and being on a Zoom together. It's right. very important that we keep understanding the importance of the support of our peers, because that has really held me through, it supported me all the way through. Mm-hmm. So I tell a lot of those stories when I was in South Africa, but I was working in a salon. It was a full service salon, a hair salon. It was called unglamorously Alberts of Fish Lane, which sounds just awful but it was actually the top salon in Cape Town at that time very busy and I was working um giving skincare treatments and also giving um manicures and pedicures because I I had qualified as a nail technician as well so I was doing a manicure actually I was giving a client a manicure um literally chair side as they were having their hair blow dried and I, I saw our sales representative from Redken, which was the hair products we used, mm-hmm. uh, Michael Lawton, who features a lot in the in the story because yes. he joined us at Dermalogica. Yeah. Uh, Michael walked in. He was our sales rep for Redken at the time. And he walked in with this other guy who I'd never seen, who was in a three-piece suit, which I thought was super glamorous at that time, <laughs> and a tie. And 
really sort of fit looking and dark hair with a mustache and sort of looked a bit like to me Michael Corleone in 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 the Godfather <laughs> 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 I I which I, is you know, that's a that is a good visual I have to I have to applaud that one because I, know, I feel right? like that is spot on right there yes yeah <laughs> yeah because he's got had a lot of presence yes and uh and he came and introduced himself to everyone in the salon which I was also impressed with uh, he was Michael's boss's boss he was running the division for the okay. distributor for Redkin and I thought to myself that person I don't know who they are that mm -hmm. person is significant okay and I didn't really, I, I thought, I imagined it was significant because obviously he was a big deal at Redkin, but mm -hmm. it wasn't only that. It was, I had a personal feeling of significance. And I talk about this, one might call it intuition. You might call it, you know, a feeling, a vibe. You might call it, you know, mutual attraction, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. But whenever somebody, I don't care if you're at a cocktail party and somebody is on the other side of the room, when you have a feeling that something or someone or some word it doesn't matter what it is, is significant. It makes you pay attention, mm -hmm. pay attention, because yeah. I don't think it's random. And okay. it was another year or two till I saw Raymond a second time, but I never forgot that first time. And even though on the second time we met each other, I talk about the fact that we were playing very cool, <laughs> both, of, both of us remembered that first meeting as well. I love that. And then and there you go, a few years later, you're business partners and you're starting to disrupt the industry, of course, in 1983 yeah. with the International Dermal Institute. And of yeah. course, Dermalogica in 1986. And Dermalogica is, is definitely a significant part of the book. Um, and we won't share all the details with that because we definitely want to leave some something for you guys to be able to experience <laughs> and read and kind of get some insight into. But there was quite a process with Dermalogica. It's not like it just popped up, like here's the name, here's the product and let's go. There was a lot of processes from actually picking the name, uh, finding the chemist, figuring out the type of products because the products that were being created by you in 1986 were completely opposite of what was really happening. Um, mm -hmm. in the industry. And a lot of our therapists are probably already thinking to themselves, yes, right? No fragrances, no, no dyes, no lanolin, no artificial colors, and kind of the list goes on. What do you feel from kind of like that original startup would be a great piece of the story that you'd like to share today? Like maybe as far as like the product development or something that really sticks out in your mind? I know the list is probably too many, but I would just love to, to have a small well, story. You know, as you're, as you're telling this, uh, you're sort of giving the, the framework of it, what mm -hmm. always stands out to me is the incredible excitement we had. I mean, there was, uh, we just, you know, I just talked about this, this idea of being significant. Yeah. I, I just, we both knew this was something we felt very, very special. We felt it was very special. And we just, mm -hmm. we just were absolutely convinced that other people would feel the same. Right. that it was a product that eliminated ingredients we didn't boast about a magic secret ingredient we talked about what we didn't have in mm -hmm. um, we wanted the products to be um easy to understand special cleansing gel um skin smoothing cream soothing eye makeup remover we didn't want it to be mysterious in any way we wanted it to be education based and remember, we'd had the International Dermal Institute for three years. So we were an education company that was developing a product. Mm -hmm. We were not a product company that was somehow designing education. Right. So it's very, very different. So when we were coming from that, that, that base of education and, and credibility with the International Dermal Institute, we had to connect the name to that. So we knew it was dermal was going to be in the name somehow. We wanted it to sound pharmaceutical. So we decided to use Latin because pharmaceuticals are written in Latin. And we came, first of all, it was dermological with an L. And then Raymond said, I think it's better with that. I think it's dermological. And I said, yeah, I do too. It sounds more like pharma car you know it sounds it mm -hmm. sounds ending with a vowel sounds sort of I don't know different we liked it we just liked it better right. um so naming the product it all came from that base of we're an education company with credibility right. so there's going to be no gimmicks there's going to be no secrets there's going to be no prom false promises the names aren't going to be mysterious it's not going to be you know secret Bulgarian youth oil or anything <laughs> like that 
So, um, which, you know, it's fine if that's your gig, that's fine. It wasn't going to be named after me, that was for right. sure, because that was just too, it, that's not who we were and not who we are. And I didn't, I didn't for that. the only thing I've ever put my name on is this book because it's the, my story. I didn't want yeah. to own the name of, you know, the product. So, um, yeah, that was, I tell those the bits of that. And then how do you find a chemist to, to make a product that's never been made before? And how do you do it when you haven't got any money to pay them? And I talk about exactly how we did it yeah. and the formula we came up with and the contract that we proposed to the chemist. And, and, and what happened a month before we launched Dermalogica when the chemist refused to release the formulas yes. unless he was paid out. And so I talk about that too. And all the way through, uh, we were absolutely determined that we had an idea that was worth bringing out. Mm -hmm. And and Dermalogica, I'm not going to say it was an instant success in like, you know, all the applause of the world. Some people were just, you know, really didn't understand it at all. But we had our core group mm -hmm. of students who had already been trained by us. And they told me that they they bleed gray as they still say mm -hmm. and um named themselves uh you know a tribe because they right. felt that they they were connected together in a very unique way with their own language and their own appearance and their own way of doing things and and I took that as a huge compliment and that exactly. became Dermalogica yeah right. so we're talking about you know inspiration or one thing that you were really kind of focused on. And I always come to me, I think as, well, as a student, of course, a long time ago, I'm not going to date myself on that. <laughs> but <laughs> as an educator, I you know I've been with, I, you know, had my, my first day of work was in November of 2004. So definitely have seen a lot of the changes. But one of the key things I think that you were, you tell so often and so well in the story was just the strong belief behind daily microfoliant. Yeah. And I think of daily microfoliant, there's always been that kind of like this legend of how was it developed? How did it come about? And wait, a powder, you know, that happened, you know, so many years ago. And, and I mean, very true to dermatological form, I feel like we've always been kind of ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and innovation and products. Sometimes we're actually super far too ahead, far ahead. Too far too far ahead. ahead. <laughs> um but I thought it'd be great if you could just maybe just share set the record straight share a little bit about the daily microfoliant and kind of some of the inspiration behind that product well inspiration comes from random places that's why you should always be paying attention because right. you just don't know when it's going to hit you and I've been teaching in Japan uh actually I've been teaching in Japan South Korea and Taiwan for Takara Belmont and for Dermalogica. And we've always had a close relationship with Takara Belmont. They supplied all of our skincare equipment in the beginning. Raymond worked for them at one point in the beginning. And so you know, we've always, loyalty is another piece that kind of threads through my story. We've had long relationships with a lot of people. Um, so I was teaching for them and I was, I was really burnt out. I was really tired and, and teaching in translation, as you know, Beth, is, is often difficult. And you know, you're in a new country and I needed a break before I flew back to the States. So I took myself off to a traditional Japanese onsen, uh, the foot of Mount Fuji. There's a hot spring, sort of mineral hot spring spa town called Hakone. Mm -hmm. And I went there um, for a week with the intention of almost like a silent retreat because I don't speak Japanese and they spoke no, no English. So I, I was going to be inspired, you know, by the hot springs in Mount Fuji and being in Japan and all, all the people I taught and all this swirl in my head. I tell the story detailed about how I did not feel any inspiration when I was at the hot spring. Yes. I didn't have any, any good idea. I, I was trying so hard, you know, be inspired, come up with an idea, mm -hmm. look at the mountain, look at your Zen garden. And it was all fantastic. But I had, I was trying to force the idea, which cannot mm -hmm. work. You cannot force creativity. And on the very long two and a half hour cab ride back to Tokyo from Hakone at the end of this week which I thought had been unproductive I started thinking just going over in my head what had happened that week and mm -hmm. my mind kept drifting back to a very traditional Japanese treatment I'd love to say you know I invented powder exfoliation no I did not because this was a very traditional Japanese technique that we took and changed and improved by adding enzymes 
and extracts, etc. But the core of daily microfoliant is a rice powder base that is used in traditional Japanese skin treatments, not just on the face, but on the body to brighten and smooth the skin. And I came back with that thought and presented it with a lot of, of uh, excitement to Diana Howard, who was then our head of research and development yeah. and uh, had to fight for it to be a powder with our marketing department who wanted it to be a cream. And it's the only time I, I say in the book, uh, it's the only time I've ever pulled rank where I actually said to the team, yeah. listen, I know you disagree with me, but I'm making the decision on this. It is a powder and here's why. And I said to them, if in six months time, this is not a success, we will discontinue it and we'll relaunch it as a cream. But as you know, it was a success pretty much straight away. Yeah. And uh, so I do have a lot uh, to thank for that one week in Hakone. But at the time, I completely underestimated the impact it was going to have on yeah. my life and on our industry. I think now, it, what is it? One one daily microfiliant is sold every forty five seconds. Yes, I mean it's. I mean it's the most iconic formula that we have. It's kind of. It's. I mean millions. You know, are sold worldwide. And I think yeah. anytime anyone thinks of Dermalogica, they immediately start to think of and kind of associate that with Chris Daily Microfoliant, which was such a game changer and is still the, the favorite yeah. of every, everyone out there. So yeah. I think that's such a great part of the book because you also are finding different areas of inspiration in the most unexpected spaces which is kind of how the book is laid out. You actually laid the book out by rooms. So not like a traditional, you know, chapter wise It's actually yeah. different types of rooms. And then there's stories and different nuances and experiences that you share based upon what happened, you know, for you in that particular room. And there's the, you know, there's the bravery room, there's the invisible room. So I think one of the questions I want to ask you, what what had you just, how did you decide, I guess, how did you decide that? Let me share some of these stories by moving from kind of room to rooms in the book. Well, I love this idea of, of, of doll houses and houses. And I've, I've actually, you've heard me speak about this in, in presentations I've given many times to our educators around um, moving through the rooms of a house is like moving through the periods in our life and you find treasures in every room. And I first came, I, that the analogy was first shared to me with, by um, a top women's uh, health expert, Dr. Christian Northrup, who, who shared this idea of thinking of your, of your health and your life as a series of rooms and, and making discoveries in each room. I think about when I lose my glasses, which is very often, I have to say, <laughs> I've got spare pairs literally <laughs> lying everywhere because I can't see a thing. Um, and if I if I'm hunting for my glasses, you know, I look in every room and I'm looking for what what other for, oh I forgot I even left that there I left my AirPods there okay oh and my phone that's there too here's my glasses, <laughs> and this idea of discovering things in different rooms and and thank goodness you don't leave a room undiscovered because you could like miss everything you're meant to have with you. So I use that analogy as a as a way of describing our lives, and it doesn't all fit neatly you've left some things in a room you have to go back and find them there's other things left undiscovered but if we're to find our true purpose and for me that's the point of being here in the first place we must mm -hmm. because we're all individual there must be an individual reason of why we're here um, I just don't believe it's random right. so how do you find that out it's a bit like a treasure hunt and I so I use this analogy of searching every room mm -hmm. to make sure you find your bravery your empathy, your kindness, your creativity, um, the invisible magical part of you that maybe we can't define, the hidden part of you that maybe will always just stay very close to your heart and you, mm -hmm. and you may not share it. That's okay. We all have a chapter of our book that we don't read out loud, but we must read it to ourselves because if we don't, we miss perhaps one of the most important tools we'll need in a room in the future. So I talk about this idea of gathering our, our treasures as we go through so that ultimately when we've lived our life uh, in the physical being, we've discovered everything and found the reason we were here in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a key aspect of, 
of the book as well. And you talk about that and you bring that kind of thread through there of being found. Yeah, I love that word. It's one of my favorite words, yeah. And I think that is so exciting because it actually then, of course, you know, connects to the nonprofit that I wanted to talk about briefly too, which is Found LA. And, you know, so the book is out. Um, it's available for, for purchase. And I think what's interesting is that because you've given so much time and talent and love to the industry, the book is no different. And 100% of the proceeds are actually going back to the nonprofit Found LA. So I thought it would be yeah. a great for you to just take a moment and share a little bit more about that organization. Um, this, this idea of a skill set training, of mm-hmm. self-determination, of financial independence, especially for women, minorities, immigrants, has always been a part of my, of my life, my work. At Domologica in 2010, it was our 25th anniversary in coming up for 2011, and we established FIGHT, financial independence through entrepreneurship, and we committed to fund 25,000 women to start their own business around the world. We are now at about 110,000 women that have uh, gone through the fight funding program. And I love that model and 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 I appreciated that. And we now focus so much on education and making sure that people have skill sets uh, in our industry to be able to be financially independent. Mm -hmm. And in my personal capacity with uh, our family foundation, I wanted to do something around local businesses, especially um, in in the city that brought us success, which is Los Angeles, but I'd like to see it replicated in every city. And this idea, we call it found, and the idea is about discovering the entrepreneurs on your high street and main street, seeing them, finding them, supporting them, because without those salons and dog groomers and florists and bakeries and coffee shops and car mechanics that are local to us, we don't have the glue of our communities and our neighborhoods. And that is the thing which sustains our humanity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to live next to the Amazon warehouse. I want to live next door to the coffee shop owned by two people who know me, who I can go in and have a cup of coffee and look around. And I may not say a word sometimes but I'm basking in the glue of our community and our neighborhoods Mm -hmm. and I think it's just critically important we're back to human connection so a hundred percent of the proceeds from the book are going to support local entrepreneurs and at found.org it's foundla.org if you look online uh, there's lots of resources and support. It's free. Go on. You can apply for funding. You can apply for education training. It could be virtual or in person and connection to other entrepreneurs. And I encourage every one of our salon owners to do that. Everyone who has a business who might be watching this or listening to it or reading the book. Uh, the details are in the book and 100% of the proceeds go to support those entrepreneurs. I love that. I just think that's such a powerful aspect of just everything that you do that the community has actually, you know, been built upon for, for Dermalogica and just kind of the, the underlying kind of mission and ethos of the brand as well too. So I'm going to ask you a small favor on our last little bit of our podcast today. And I'd love for you to read a small section from the book. And I know there's a section that talks about how to always love your work. And I feel like that's so insightful and such an amazing message that I know it's a take, it was a takeaway for me from reading the book as well, but I thought it'd be great if you could just share a small excerpt with our listeners today. Well, thank you, Beth, for that opportunity. Of course. Um, I think it starts with that. Once you love your work, Mm -hmm. you find your heart. Mm -hmm. And if you find your heart in your work, uh, you never work a day in your life. (laughs) That's great. It all becomes part of what you you are. It's um, from the book, Skin in the Game, uh, written by me. And this is a section uh, entitled, How to Always Love Your Work. And this comes in the why room, about finding your bigger why and who benefits from it. We don't look for the work we love, it finds us. 
we may have a passion or love for something, but honestly, if we can't develop a skill to master it, it's hard to be successful at it. We need a paying job, not an expensive hobby. When I started in the salon industry, it wasn't that I loved it immediately. I gradually fell in love with it. I fell in love as I became more skilled and people appreciated what I did for them. It's a process of development and it takes time. Like any relationship, we sometimes enjoy it, but don't love it. And others we love quickly and later find out we were misguided. We hit the jackpot when we find something that holds our interest and in learning about it and becoming skilled, we fall in love with the work. Then if we start being able to support ourselves through that work, there is a good chance we will stick with it long enough to be successful. The people who truly love their work forever are those who have found a higher purpose in it, the bigger why, to what their work means to others. That true higher purpose will keep them motivated and ambitious throughout their entire career. It's the reason that physicians, nurses, teachers, and religious leaders all find their work deeply satisfying. It's not just about them. They are all working for a much bigger why health, life, education, and spiritual wholeness. What's the higher purpose of what your work does for others? In order to stay motivated and driven, you simply must find it, or you will be enslaved to a job that you will have to justify through the money or the perks. That's not nearly enough to satisfy our soul for a whole life. What if you are locked into a job that you can't leave or have few opportunities to change? Even more reason to dig deep for the higher purpose of doing it. Find it. Don't stop looking until you have. Some might think that my work is frivolous and that it was vanity promoting superficial nonsense that preys on women's insecurities. A comment actually said to me once at a dinner. That is not my work at all. I frame my work as having a huge and impactful purpose of human connection, kindness, health, and even more, independence, entrepreneurship, and the creation of an industry that creates more business owners and jobs for women than any other. If I didn't believe that deep in my soul, I could never have stayed in the same industry for my entire life and loved it throughout. Ask any successful person who is genuinely motivated and fulfilled. They believe they have a higher purpose in their life and work. Find yours. It's critical. Who does your work serve? How does it improve their life in some way? How can you make that impact even bigger? What work would? And that's how I fell in love with the industry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane, for reading that. I think, again, I think it's our second or third goosebump moment that we probably have had uh, during this podcast together. So thank you so much for taking the time today to really just show and share some more intimate insight into the book that you have so just perfectly written. And again, everyone, it's out on the shelf for you to get. We'll leave links for you to be able to Go ahead and make sure that Skin in the Game is on your bookshelf um, before the holidays. So thanks so much, Shane, for being here. We just, again, I feel like there's so much that we could say to thank you for all the, you know, inspiration and advice and caring and even hand-holding that you have done probably for so many of us around the world. Um, so we're just glad to be able to have this time with you to talk about such a great success and just get everyone inspired in finding their true purpose. Thank you. And I wish you a happy holidays. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you in the new next. See you next year.